Hello and welcome to the Chemicals Knowledge Hub, your one-stop shop for all the latest industry insights. I'm Elizabeth Bogue and I'm joined today by three guests. I'm joined by Philip Wheeler, Business Development Manager at Umacore, Dick Peterson, VP Chemistry at ProVV, a Umacore customer, and Bob Grubbs, Victor and Elizabeth Atkins Professor of Chemistry at the California Institute of Technology. Bob was the winner of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2005 alongside Professor Chauvin and Professor Schrock. So, Bob, can you kick us off just by telling us about your background and what led you to working in Metathesis? Okay, yeah. So I, uh, you know, I, I I started out in a rural rural area. Went to college to be an agriculture major. Discovered organic chemistry. Uh, then uh, started, you know, went to graduate school. And then when I was a postdoc, I was uh, at Stanford. Uh, my major professor Jim Coleman came back from a from a consulting trip and started talking about this crazy reaction that converted provolene into ethylene into butene. And, and as an organic chemist, I had no clue how this reaction might happen, nor did anyone else. And so people didn't even know what the catalyst was or how it happened. And so this struck me as being a, a good place for a, a young professor to start out. And uh, so, you know, I've been fascinated by metathesis since probably that was probably 1968. So it's been a few years uh, that I've been thinking about metathesis and trying to understand how it happens, what the transformation is, and then uh, how to make better catalysts and then what applications you can, those can be used for. Fantastic, thank you, Bob. And same question to you, Philip. Can you tell us a bit about your background and experience in the field of metathesis? Uh, sure. I mean, my, my background and experience with metathesis is not as extensive as either of the, uh, your other two guests. My background is more in general catalysis, metal catalysis, uh, and also a little bit of organocatalysis as well. Um, I also have some experience in pharmaceutical process chemistry, which uh, I did prior to the grad graduate school. Um, but then for the past uh, almost 10 years now, uh, I've been focused on commercial roles, um, still in, in a technical capacity, leveraging my, my chemistry background and specifically catalysis background. Um, so what led me to work in metathesis was actually uh, an opportunity to work at Materia Inc., which is the company that Bob Grubbs founded, Bob Grubbs and, and, uh, and others, uh, founded back in the late 90s in order to commercialize the uh, Grubbs Catalyst technology. So. Uh, and then starting in 2018, uh, Umicor acquired Materia's Catalyst business, uh, and I moved over from there. So that's my background. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Philip. And um, Dick, same question to you. I'm also noticing a difference in pronunciation with me and my English pronunciation of metathesis, and um, you guys all say metathesis. So um, I'm going to correct myself. Um, Dick, let me know about your background and experience in the field of metathesis. Sure. Uh, I started uh, about 25 years ago when Bob only had two catalysts that were commercialized. And uh, so uh, Bob helped me uh, develop the first uh, ruthenium catalyzed route into insect pheromones. And that was the what, late 90s, so to speak. And Bob and I have been working together ever since to commercialize uh, new applications, new catalysts. Uh, we developed technology for the Haveda ligands. Uh, it's one of the, uh, it's a a scalable ligand that we could put on a catalyst for the pharmaceutical industry. And then from there, we developed some technology for elements uh, that is a biorefiner that's in Gresik, Indonesia. And basically you take palm oil and split across the backbone. Uh, and then we've developed also various uh, insect pheromones. Uh, and the last one that Bob helped us with was the stereotin of catalyst. We had an interesting result in our lab and I approached Bob and I said, this result makes no sense. And Bob says, that's the model in my head. <laughs> And uh, from there on, it's, uh, we were able to commercialize that. And I'm actually, that's, I'm using that catalyst right now. It's a very interesting catalyst and we're, uh, we're very excited that uh, it's going to be commercialized. So. Well, I'm honored to be talking to three such experts in the field. Um, so Bob, tell me, um, how has the implementation of metathesis technologies changed the chemical industry over the past decade? Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's it, it's had applications, and so it's basically a new tool of how to put molecules together. And so, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, it's opened new ways of making new structures. Which you know, the first Hep C hepatitis C drug was uh, was used a metathesis catalyst, and they're still coming along. Uh, 
and in the uh, uh, in the biorefinery and other areas, it's open new tools there for making new things. And you know, there was a very large biorefinery in Indonesia which uh, makes things from palm oil. As Dick just pointed out, making pheromones. Uh, Dick will talk more about it, but you know, hopefully, being able to make pheromones cheap enough so that they can become uh, really important materials. And then in the materials area, uh, is is making new polymers and new new plastics. And so it's uh, it's opened a new a new realm of, of materials. For example, one was a uh, insulating coating for a pipe that's now uh, pumping oil at the bottom of the Gulf. It's forty miles long and a foot in diameter. And so so basically, the simple tool of being able to make new carbon-carbon double bonds uh, has you know, provided tools for a whole range of different industries. Uh, wow, fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that, um, Bob. Okay, so Dick, um, tell me how important would you say efficient processes are to getting ahead in your industry? Uh, I, I'd say it's extremely important, and that's part of our uh, technology advantage is that we license a technology from um, Umicore and from Zemo. Uh, they both make metastasis catalysts. Uh, so we're going after the opportunity of using insect pheromones in row crops, and that's corn, soybean, and rice. And this is something that nobody's ever done before because the cost of the pheromone has always been too expensive to uh, get into these applications. And with the recent advantages of the stereotype of cattle and these cis-selective cattle, we're able to uh, get into these opportunities, and we're trying to drive the price of the pheromone down below $100 a kilo. The ultimate target is $50 a kilo, uh, which, which is would be a major stretch, but it's a challenge that we have. Uh, we launched our first product in Mexico for fall armyworm. Last year, it had been hugely successful. Uh, we have farmers that come back and say they didn't do any chemical sprays, and their fields are loaded with it, ladybugs. And that's very exciting because these farmers have never seen ladybugs in their fields before because they use chemicals, uh, insecticides, and it just kills everything. And the advantage of ladybugs are they eat aphids and they eat the fall armyworm eggs. So now you have a natural predator coming in to help control it. So uh, we're very, very excited about that. We also got it in Brazil and Kenya and uh, for the corn, and we're trying to get rice into Indonesia. We're doing a soft launch, and then we're doing soybeans in South America. So the only reason we can get into these opportunities is because the cost of the products coming down, and that's mainly due to metathesis applications. Okay, so you mentioned um, cost being a challenge there. Um, what are other, um, what, or what are the main challenges for companies looking for more efficient chemistry or chemical processes? Yeah, so the challenge that we've been facing is some of this technology is so new, we're trying to figure out who, where's the IP landscape actually lie. Uh, so there's, uh, it's starting to get more and more clear, but we've been pushing forward with the, the different opportunities. And then it's the supply chain. How do we actually get the catalyst made in a timely fashion? And we've, I've actually been working on trying to get one of these catalysts made for almost two years, uh, which seems like a long time, and it is, but one of the... Uh, Ligands is quite challenging, and I think we're getting close to getting that resolved. But so I got to get the supply chain figured out, then I got to get the company to make the catalyst, and then I got to do the application development work, which takes a period of time. Then you scale it up, and then I got to get it registered in the country you want to apply it to. And registration takes about a year. So you put all that together, it's about a three year timeline from when I start to when I get commercial registration. So you got to plan ahead, you got to, uh, you know, Make sure you hit all your milestones and timelines uh, to actually get the product out in the field. And we need good support all the way through the line for our custom manufacturing organizations, to the formulators, to product development, to end marketing. So uh, it's it's interesting and it's fun, but there's a lot of things you gotta be aware of before you dive into this. Absolutely. Um, so over to you then, Philip. Um, can you outline some of the way that Umicore, or some of the ways that Umicore can um, help industries overcome some of these challenges? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Dick was just mentioning the importance of being able to, to scale up the catalyst, and that's something that, uh, you know, some, some catalysts are going to be more difficult than others. Um, but we have a team that's, uh, that, that's, that's really what they do is not just with the metathesis catalyst, but any sort of uh, metal complex, that's really our, our core competency is how to produce those uh, reliably and efficiently at scale. And, uh, you know, in the agrochemical industry, uh, you're talking about on the catalyst 
on the catalyst side, tens, hundreds of kilos. Um, but we also have projects that even go up to metric tons of catalyst in other industries. Um, so that's really kind of the end goal is to get to that commercialization, um, which Umicor has the, has the capability and the, the tools to do. Um, but then also on the other side, you know, when there's an organization um, who's trying to implement metathesis maybe to a new problem, and they're still at the very uh, small scale, um, we also have a team of scientists who really specialize in that. Um, uh, this is actually a team of scientists that started at Materia, um, and they're still located in Southern California. Um, but they've now expanded uh, their scope of work also to things like cross-coupling reactions as well. But I think in the, in the metathesis area, this is still you know, one of the best, really top organizations in the world to come to uh, if you're looking for someone to optimize metathesis reactions and just generate proof of concept and see whether metathesis might be uh, a cost-effective and, and uh, useful solution for, for the, whatever molecule you're trying to make. Okay, so um, yeah. Dick, what is it that sets metathesis apart? Uh, it's the ability to run reactions without solvents. Uh, and so you can get really high throughput on your metastasis reactions. Um, uh, all our reactions that we run, we do not use solvent at all. It's just the two key raw starting materials. And we use, usually use one of the raw materials in excess to drive the equilibrium over the product formation. Uh, and so give an example, we just completed a over 30,000 kilo campaign in Europe to make a product for us. Uh, we had to do five times more traditional chemistry steps to do a carbon-carbon bond formation than metathesis. So because we could run metathesis neat, it was very efficient. We got over 85% yields on it. Uh, it's a wonderful reaction. But then we got to the traditional chemistries. We had to run solvent, dilute. It took so much longer. So metathesis is a clear advantage in processing. If you get the right substrate, you get the right target. Fantastic. Um, so, Bob, um, what impact can we and it expect? Is worth, hold on, hold on a second. I think it's worth pointing out. That, I think it's worth pointing out in case there's a, a, like pharmaceutical chemists who watch this. That's a, D Dick is running cross metathesis reactions, and so that's really a special kind of feature about cross metathesis. And I think it's uh, could be probably utilized more in other other industries. Um, but in the case of, uh, I think in the, if we talk about pharmaceutical industry where they're usually doing a ring closing metathesis, usually with solvent. Um, you know, the first type of application that's been really popularized is a macrocyclization. Um, and, and that's actually Bob alluded to the macrocyclic hepatitis C drugs. Um, and so I think in the pharmaceutical industry, what really sets metathesis apart is it's a unique bond disconnection that opens up alternate pathways of making these molecules. Um, you know, even on the discovery stage, it's really changed the type of molecule that medicinal chemists can design. Um, but on the process chemistry side, even as a second generation route, even to go back and, and kind of do a, a, a new retrosynthesis of a, of a compound using a carbon-carbon bond as a disconnection, um, that really can open up possibilities for much more efficient processes. Absolutely. Thanks very much for interjecting there, Philip. Um, yeah. No, not at all. Sorry Thanks very that. much for that. Um, so now uh, on to you, Bob. What impact can we expect metathesis technologies to have on a multitude of markets moving forward? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, and it's been around for quite a while and it takes a long time for things to break in. And and as Dick said, they're, they're pushing it into the pheromone uh, field, which would be wonderful. And that's been that's one of the areas that I've been most excited about in metathesis from the beginning. Uh, you know, in the materials side, uh, as I say, things are now scaling up. It's been demonstrated on a big scale. And so, you know, there's pipe coatings, there's, uh, there's uh, making, uh, making uh, you know, wind turbines, there's uh, making a whole variety of, of parts that are, uh, uh, that can be quite large and take advantage of the unique properties of the polymer. And so it's, it's, it's just working its way into the, into the market. And uh, so hopefully over the next few years, it'll, it'll really take off in the, in the materials area. And then in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical area, uh, Philip has, has talked a lot about that. And that's, that I think is a growing, growing area as well. So yeah, so, so, and so, so the fun thing about it is really simple reaction, which I sort of, fascinated me 
early on, which was propylene to ethylene and to butene, uh, you know, is now, uh, and, in, and in fact, at one stage, I didn't think we'd ever be able to make a metathesis catalyst that would, that would tolerate functionality. Uh, but uh, of course we have, and so uh, that's really opened it up for the organic chemists. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, so Philip, how important is the rapid implementation of new innovations to the development of companies in this industry? Yeah, so in the pharmaceutical industry, which is probably where I, where I have the most experience, um, you know, time is really of the essence. Uh, so the, the clock is ticking on patent expiration ever since, you know, the first day that the composition of matter was patented back in discovery chemistry. Um, you're talking about usually a 10 year timeline before there's actually a product on the market that where they can start to recoup some of some any of the expenses that have gone into the development. So once a molecule reaches the clinical development stage, um, it is really, uh, you know, time is, is actually the most important factor. Um, but also reliability and, and reproducibility and quality as well. Um, so uh, I think with metathesis, uh, oftentimes, like I said, it's a very convenient way to make to make a, a lot of different types of, of chemical motifs, macrocycles and other rings. Um, and sometimes it can be an enabling route to really get through those first deliveries. Um, and, and later on, sometimes you can find a better way to make a molecule. Um, but as I mentioned before, the, I think there's also examples where things could go in the other direction. Uh, once there's a little bit of breathing room, let's say after the first clinical delivery and a company starts looking at the longer term route, um, there are opportunities there as well to implement new technology, especially olefin metathesis. Great. Well, thanks so much, guys. It's been really um, fascinating to talk to the three of you this afternoon. Um, is there anything any of you would like to add before, um, before we say goodbye? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for giving us an opportunity to yeah, talk about our favorite reaction. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Your enthusiasm yeah. um, comes across very clearly. It's been really, really great chatting to you guys. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Okay. Great. All thank right. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.